Bible, you can open up to 1 Kings, chapter 18, your pregame, what you just read. There should be some notes there in your notebooks. In 1997, 1997, I was a sophomore at the University of Arizona. Let's go! My son that was in the room as well. Yes, right. Right. Yeah. That's hard. It's hard for me. Uh, I was a sophomore at the University of Arizona. My wife, who was just my friend at the time, was a freshman. She was playing on the softball team. And the first week, two weeks into school, there was a teammate that invited her to an Athletes in Action meeting. My wife was not a follower of Jesus at the time, but there was something about this girl, this teammate, that was magnetic to her. She said, man, there's something about this girl. I, I want to go. She's inviting me. I'm going to go to this meeting. I don't really know what it is. And she was kind of trying everything in her, her beginning of her freshman year. She said, okay, I'm going to go to this thing. So we're friends from high school, so she invited me to come along with her to this Athletes in Action meeting. And so I ended up going. My journey was, I was in and out of church all throughout growing up, moved about every couple of years to a different state, and then landed in Phoenix right before high school. Right when we got to Phoenix, my parents split, and my mom was trying to drag us to church all the time. My dad didn't want anything to do with church and God at the time, and so I was just kind of back and forth in my relationship with God. I knew there was a God. I actually wanted to follow God, but then when I went to school, and interacted with the people that said they were Jesus followers, man, they were just weird. Let's just keep it really, like, they were anti, like, I just couldn't figure out, like, are there normal people that love Jesus? And, and in my immediate context in high school, there, were, there weren't that many people that, that were normal, that really were pursuing Jesus. And so I just kind of began to develop these friendships with good moral people. I would hang out with them, they weren't doing really bad stuff, and that was kind of my high school experience. But I was kind of empty inside of them. I was kind of going back and forth, and I'm like, man, I need this community. And then I got invited to the Athletes in Action meeting by my wife, and I was like, okay. These are the people I've been looking for. They're normal. They're passionate. They love sport. They're trying to walk with Jesus. They're not perfect by any means, but at least they have some devotion to God. And so right away, my sophomore year, I jumped into Athletes in Action. I said, okay, these are the people that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get clicked up with for the next three years of my life. Quickly after that, I started getting discipled by the AIA staff member at the University of Arizona. It started walking me through what it actually looks like to become a man that walks with God and follows God and loves your Bible and loves Jesus and loves others. And at the end of that sophomore year, he invited me to this thing called the Ultimate Training Camp. And at the time, it was in Fort Collins, Colorado. Went there and just fell in love with the environment, continued to love the people, and understand, like, how does your faith and your sport, how does that mix together on the field of competition? And I was just hooked. Continued to grow my faith, continued to grow my relationship with God, and then came back and interned the next year, came back and interned the next year, and then God called us, my wife and I, on staff with Athens Next. And we served for 16 years with AIA, a couple at the University of Dayton in Ohio, and then seven at the University of Arizona. And then we spent a large amount of our staff time um, shaping the ultimate training camps uh, in different various ways. Um, and then the Lord called us off staff two years ago uh, to be a part of a church. I'm a pastor of a local church in Phoenix, um, and that's what I do full time. But I love this material. I love that you guys are interacting with it. I love that you're here and you're taking steps of faith to understand what does it really look like to walk with God in the midst of your life. So that's a little bit about me. We'll jump into principle one here. Let me pray for us, and we'll jump into what God might have for us in 1 Kings. Father, thanks for your goodness to us. Thanks for allowing us to be here, giving us breath in our lungs this morning. Would you give us eyes to see? Give us ears to hear with your spirit. Help translate this truth to change us forever, to change me. Pray that that would be true even this morning. We expect it from you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, Tank did a great job kicking off the principles last night of what these things are that we call the AI principles. It's the gospel applied to your sport, the gospel experienced through your sport, and the gospel spoken in the language of sport. If you're not familiar with that word gospel, it's the good news. 
It's the good news that Jesus changes everything. That God loves you. He created it good. He created it beautiful. Just like Ted talked about sport. But because of what happens in Genesis chapter 3, our own choices as humans, things are broken. The Bible calls that sin. Our own choices have messed up our reality. And it's not just us individually. Sin is just not us individually, but it's cosmic. And it changes everything including our sport. So there's beauty to our sport because it's part of the creation, but it's broken. What does it look like to redeem it? This word gospel is the good news of that redeeming process. And we want to help you understand what it looks like in the midst of your competition. So here are the five questions, again, that we're going to try and answer in the midst of these principles. The first is who or what do I worship? That's what we're going to try and go after this morning. The second, this afternoon, what motivates me? The third, how do I grow? The fourth, how do I deal with suffering? And the fifth, how do I live for God's kingdom? For God's kingdom instead of my kingdom. Those are the questions we're hoping to answer every session. And let me give you some framework for how these principles work. Three things, real quick, to help you understand this material, how we're trying to communicate to you. The first is this, is that these principles build off of each other. They build on top of each other. And so if you're not really locked in and focused on this first principle, you're going to be a little bit confused when we get to the afternoon. You're going to be even more confused when we get to principle three. And so they build off of each other. So remember that as we go through them. They're intentionally woven in a certain way. That's number one. They build off each other. Number two, the environment we're trying to create is similar to your sports environment of film, practice, and game. Who watches film? And your sport, the majority of room, right? Like you watch and you try to understand what's going on with the mechanics, what's going on with the plays, and then you so you sit in a room similar to this, and so this is the film version of what we're doing. So some of you love film; you can eat it up. You're in there all the time trying to figure out how do I get better? What does this look like? And some of you are like this is film's dumb. So for the people that think film's dumb, just stay locked in for a little bit here because this is the film session. You're gathering data, and then what you do with that data is you go and you try to apply it. On the field, on the court of competition, you try to go and you practice. And so as soon as we're done with this principle, we're going to go directly to practice what we learned here. And just like in practice, your coach is going to break in. He's going to blow the whistle. She's going to blow the whistle. She's going to change something. He's going to change something and go, wait, try this. Do this. Change this. So it's not just something going on mentally, but we're actually going to physically begin to put it into practice. That's the second part. And then the third part is we're going to do our best to simulate a game time environment. And that's going to be at the end of the week. Something called the special that we've been talking about. And hopefully that will rise the intensity to say, can you really practice this? Can you really practice what we're trying to teach you? So this is film. We'll go to practice. And then we'll have game time. That's the second part of how these things work. And the third part is this. We are trying to help you. We're trying to help retrain the way you think about your sport. Did anybody come in their freshman year and a coach, a position coach, tried to change your form? Maybe your running form or your shooting form or your volleyball set? What, what did they try to change your set? How awkward did that feel? It's terrible. Because you've been doing something in athletics your whole life, and it's gotten you this far. So you've got to go, well, it's got to be working to some degree. This, this works. And then a coach will come in and like put your elbow in or move your foot out, and you're like, that feels, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And you want to just go back to doing what you've always done because it works to some degree. But your coach knows, listen, let me help you make this tweak. Let me help you make this change, and it will really affect the way you play for the better. If you trust this coach and the coach is good, you lean into the tension. And so what we're asking you to do this week is to lean into that tension. It is going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to be disorienting. It's not going to make sense. And you're going to want to go back to doing sport how you've always done it. And I'm asking you to trust us to lean into the process and just be honest. It's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to go, this stuff sounds stupid. Like, just let's be real with each other. Let's do our best to be real with each other. Is that fair? Yeah. But know there's going to be some tension, especially as we take this stuff out on the field of competition. 
Okay? So those are the three things. The principles build off each other. This is film, practice, and game. And then you're going to need to unlearn some ways of competing and relearn what we're going to try and give you. Okay? Cool. Audience of one. Let's talk about a tech talk last night that sports is a gift. It's a privilege. It's involvement provides opportunities for us to experience joy, to grow through our struggle, to interact with others as created beings. To experience the joy of God through physical exertion, emotional engagement, it taps into our human spirit. There's something beautiful and good and right about sports. But as Ted mentioned last night, if we're honest with ourselves, it's not, it's not just a game anymore. For a lot of us, our sport has become our life. Everything we do revolves around our sport. It's become the meaning of our life. It's a $420 billion industry globally, sport is. And the culture of sports wants to dictate how we plan our weekly schedules, what we wear, how we act, how we spend our money, how we think about ourselves, how we think about our worth, our value. It's all determined through this lens of sport. And our culture has raised sport to a godlike status. There was a theologian named Martin Luther back in the 1600s, and he was talking about how do you, how do you decide what God is for you? Because we can all, in the post-game interview, say, yes, glory to God, yes, I love God. But really, does your life reflect that? Does your life really reflect that you want to give all glory and honor to God? This is what Martin Luther says. He says, whatever your heart clings to and confides in. Think about that. Whatever your heart clings to and confides in. That is really your God. Whatever your heart clings to, whatever your heart confides in, let's be honest, men and women with each other. What, what are those things that your heart clings to and confides in? That is really your God. You can say you worship God, but you're really worshiping that thing your heart goes to. And one of our goals this week is to identify false idols in our lives that compete with our allegiance to God and to learn to lean into worshiping God alone. And we have to define terms. We're going to be doing this all week, okay? Because if you look at this piece of clothing right here, what do you, what do you call that? If I'm, if I'm not from here and I'm trying to learn English and I don't know the language, what is the word for this item of clothing? Okay, I heard, I heard at least three different responses. Okay, beanie, because we're from the West Coast, right? So that's why I grew up calling this a beanie. But a beanie is really like something that sits on the back of your head and like twirls a propeller, right? Like that's kind of, but I, this is what I call it. I call this a beanie. What else, what else do you call this? Other, other names? A toque. A what? That's a cannon. What is that? A toque. A toque? Yes, it's French. We're in America. Oh. <laughs> okay, I haven't heard that one. That's great. Toque. What else have you heard? Winter hat. Winter hat, yep. Heard that one? Toboggan. Toboggan, yes. Stocking cap. Toboggan, yeah. Like a, that's a southern thing. Isn't it? Amen, brother. Yeah, okay. No, it's not. I should say no, it's not. Okay, here's, here's the point. Listen, stay with me. Listen, here's the point. We can all look at this item, and we all have different uh, language for this item up here. And we're going to be throwing around some words this week. We've already done it already. Idolatry, worship. We're going to talk about sovereignty. We're going to throw around these words, and I want you to understand them. I want us to be on the same page when we say these words. And sometimes in the Christian, you can kind of walk in and you're saying one thing and I'm hearing one thing, but I'm actually thinking something else and you're thinking something else. And so let's define some terms. The first two terms we need to define this morning is idolatry and worship. So look down at your notes. What is an idol? This is what we mean when we say the word idol or idolatry, is that it's anything that begins to function as a substitute for God in your life. It may be anything that consumes your heart, thoughts, and time. So when you hear the word idolatry, don't think of these little statues. Those kind of represent what idols are, but it's, it's deeper. It's more about what's going on in your heart. It's your primary source of security, fulfillment, identity. Without this thing, whatever the thing is, you're lost. You don't know what to do. And we would say that's an idol. Anything that... Is 
functioning as a substitute for God in your life. So that's the first word that we need to identify in the midst of our talk. The second is worship. JB described worship, defined worship last night. Worship is not just singing songs, but it's ascribing ultimate worth or value to someone or something. Bowing down to someone or something with all of our heart, our mind, our soul. That is what worship is. And throughout human history, idols arise in cultures that challenges people's allegiance to God. Our goal is to turn away from these idols and bow down to God alone. So let's look back at the story you read in pregame and understanding what it looks like to turn from your idols back to God. First Kings chapter 18, you read in pregame to answer some questions. I'm curious, again, let's keep it super honest this morning. Who, who when they read this, this is the first time they've ever read this story in First Kings 18? Yes. Man, I love that. I think that's awesome that you guys are encountering something new for the first time and that it's of, of God and His Word. Um, the Old Testament doesn't get a lot of play these days, you know. I guess the New Testament doesn't either, so that's a problem. <laughs> anyway, there's really good stuff in the Old Testament, but it takes time to understand it. And culturally, it's kind of hard to navigate sometimes, but it's definitely, definitely worth your investment. Um, so 1 Kings 18, what we're going to find here in the story you read, we're going to see a problem, we're going to hear a warning, we're going to get a response to that warning, and then we're going to look at a revelation, four things. And all of these four things should be pushing us to make a decision. At the end of the day, that's what this text is. You need to make a decision for everyone in the room. That's where it should be heading for us. Let me give you a little bit of context as we kind of parachute into what's happening in 1 Kings 18. Again, because it's a little bit hard historically to understand what's happening. God's people, God calls out a people for himself. It's the nation of Israel, Genesis chapter 12. You see that in a man named Abraham. He says, I'm going to make you my people, and through you, you're going to bless the nations. So God calls out a people. They become the nation of Israel, both in ethnicity and in religion. They're supposed to follow the one true God, Yahweh. And as everybody looks at them, they go, man, there's something different about those people. What is it? And they're supposed to say, I follow Yahweh, this God, and you can follow him too. Let me help you do that. The problem is the Israelites, God's people, are humans. And just like us, we continue to mess up and not do the right things. I'm assuming the slides switch up. Yeah, it's probably, yeah, write it down. Divided worship. So what's happening is the people of Israel, they're looking around at the other cultures, and the other cultures are worshiping other gods, and the other cultures have kings. They have leaders that they appoint. And so the nation of Israel says, well, well, they're doing it. We want to have a king too, God. And God's like, no, you, I am your king. You don't need a human representative. I am going to be your king. And the people are like, no, we see what they're doing. We want to do it as well. And so God finally says, okay, you want a king? I will give you a king gives them Saul. That turns out all kinds of bad in the Bible. And then David comes in. He, God brings in David, a man after his own heart, to lead the people to be the king that God has called him to be. And uh, David does great things. He does bad things, but he also does great things for the Lord. And then the next king is Solomon, his son, David's son. And that picks up in 1 Kings. And then what kings is, it's all these different kings after Solomon. King after king. And some do really right in the Lord's eyes. And some do really evil in the Lord's eyes as kings. And as goes the leader, goes the community, right? You guys see that on your team. Whoever the leader is, a lot of time the culture will set in. And so what's happening is there's this king named Ahab. That's the king we find ourselves in 1 Kings 18. And it says Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord. And some of that is because he marries this gal named Jezebel. And Jezebel has all these gods she worships, these idols. She doesn't worship the God of the Bible, and Ahab takes her as his wife, and so she begins to influence the culture to follow these different idols. And then what God says is, I'm going to send somebody, Elijah, to be the mouthpiece, to help you understand this is not okay. I'm not okay with this. 
for you to be acting like this. And so God sends Elijah, and Elijah tells Ahab, there's going to be a drought. There's not going to be any rain. And then Elijah dips, and he hides out in like a cave, because Ahab wants to kill him, because there's literally no rain. And you have to understand in that culture, stay with me, like, you can't run to the grocery store to get food. What happens if you don't have rain? You don't have food. You don't have culture. You, like, so a drought for three years is kind of a big deal at this time. So that's what happens. It hasn't rained for three years. And then Ahab and Elijah meet each other. God tells Elijah to go meet Ahab, and this is where we pick up in the story. And they have a showdown. And basically say, listen, this is, we're going to put both gods up against each other. You're going to bring your prophets that worship Baal, this idol, and I'm going to bring the one true God. And we're going to see whose God really shows up. And this story is really about a story about us as well, like all of the Bible. It's a confrontation between your idols and God. Whatever's competing for the number one spot in your life, is it sports, is it relationships, is it career, money, sex, food, gadgets, knowledge, anything other than God himself. Let's see what happens at Mount Carmel. You guys already wrote it in. The problem is this. There's divided worship. Choosing between the living God or counterfeit gods. Elijah challenges the people to do away with their idols and make the choice to follow the one true God. Because what's happening, the people are hopping back and forth. Some translations say they're limping back and forth between following God, the God of the Bible. They want to follow him, but then they want to follow Baal. Because God doesn't seem to be showing up. There's no rain, so ah, I'm going to follow this God over here. And they keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they've forgotten Deuteronomy 6.5 that says you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. They can't decide who they want to worship. And the result is half uh, this half-hearted commitment. It's kind of lukewarm, lacking convictions, and their worship's divided and misdirected. And we do the same thing today. We do. We go back and forth between trusting God and then trusting these things that we think will give us life. And if you're like that as an athlete, there's an example of an old school lunch plate. Have you guys seen these before? Right? Everything is compartmentalized. Everything is divided. You got sport, you got family, you got God, you got friends, you got school. And you go, well, listen, I have God on the plate. Right? He's in there. He's, he's one of the compartments. But what happens if you divide your worship is that you're kind of making God do what you want him to do for you? He's kind of a lucky rabbit's foot, or he'll bless you, and yeah, I believe in God, but, but this is important as well. This is what divided worship looks like for an athlete who worships many gods, little g gods. Let's look at the text, verse 21 of 1 Kings 18. Listen to what it says that you read this morning. It says, and Elijah came near to all the people. He's got all the prophets there. He comes near to all the people. He says this, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. The silence in this text is significant. And they don't answer him. They're silent in making this choice between their two gods they're going back and forth with. Because they're really saying, can I really trust God? Like, I can trust Baal. That there's an idol, and I see rain in the sky. Like, I can kind of trust him, but can I really trust this God in the Bible, Yahweh? Like, I don't see him. I'm not really sure how he operates. Can I really trust him? And so going back and forth. And because of that, they don't know what to do. They're silent in their response to Elijah's question to them. And the world says, Show me, show me, and then I'll trust. That's kind of the world's formula, right? Kind of show me, and then I'll trust you. But the God of the Bible says, trust me, and then I'll show you. <laughs> trust me, and then I'll show you. And that's what's happening here. That's the way God operates. He's saying, I am the God of the Bible. I do not need to show you anything. How about look at the mountains? Look at the ocean. I created everything. That's 
not enough to show you for you to trust me. God is calling the people to trust through Elijah. They, they don't know what to say. Tim Keller says it this way. He's a pastor in New York City. He says, the greatest danger, the greatest danger is not that we become atheists. An atheist is somebody that doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe God exists. That's not the greatest danger. The greatest danger is that we ask for God to coexist with the idols in our heart, to look like that divided plate. God deserves wholehearted worship directed to him alone, not a coexistent sharing of his glory with idols that we lean on. But he's not going to force you to worship him. He won't. He gives you a choice. You have a choice in the matter. And the danger is trying to do both, going back and forth between both. And if you're going to worship idols, you need to know something about them. Let's listen to what happens on Mount Carmel, verses 25 through 29. Let me read it to you again to remind you. It says, Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull, prepare it first, and go, uh, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took, uh, and they took the bull that was given to them, and they prepared it, and they called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. There was no voice. And no one answered. And they limped around the altar. There's that word limped again. They limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he's God. Either he's musing, or he's relieving himself, or he's on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with swords and lances, until the blood gushed upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of offering, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. When we're talking about divided worship, one athlete that I think does not divide his worship is an athlete named Kobe Bryant. Kobe retired a couple years ago from basketball, and after he finished basketball, he wrote a memoir called Dear Basketball. And it became an animated short. He won the Academy Award for Best Animated Short, I think, last year or the year before last. So I want to watch a clip of Dear Basketball, not in its entirety, but just short. And I want you to listen to the language. Listen to the, the heart language that Kobe Bryant used when he's talking about the sport of basketball. Check this out. So I don't, I don't want you to... Here's the fear in showing something like that. I don't want you to feel like you can't love your sport. There's something about that that is beautiful. In the midst of falling in love with a game, it can be beautiful. But did you hear the language that Kobe Bryant is using? I gave you my all, my soul. Like, I'm wondering, like, how does Kobe Bryant's wife feel about that? That she's second to basketball? Like, honestly. So it's not that you can't love your sport, but when you give everything to your sport, it's going to become an idol. And you're going to start to see, just like Kobe, that it can't fulfill you forever. Sport is beautiful. Marriage is beautiful. Kids are beautiful. But if they become the number one thing in your life, they become idolatrous. My wife is amazing. I love her. But she is not God. My kids are amazing. I love them. They are not God. They make lousy gods. They do. Your sport is a lousy God. You think it will fill you, and it will momentarily, but ultimately it's lousy. It will not give you what God can give you. And if you're going to go all in on your sport, like, go all in. Like, do it like Kobe. Like, at least I respect that. Like, go all in on your sport, but no, if you're trying to serve the God of the Bible, that will not work. Because God does not play second. He doesn't. He wants your heart, your soul, everything inside of you, including your sport. So if you're going to go all in on your sport and say, I'm all in on my sport, don't worship God. Just don't go all out. Don't believe the Bible. Don't believe Jesus. That's what we're suggesting for you to do. But if you're in with Jesus, go all in. And learn how to worship God through your sports. 
That's what we want to try and teach you this week. There's a freedom to it, as Tag mentioned last night. I imagine there's three people in the room this morning. Here's my guess. Some of you need to make a decision for the first time. You've never committed to Jesus. You didn't grow up in church. You're not even sure why you're here. We keep talking about Jesus. You're like, I don't even know who Jesus is. A teammate invited me. I somehow showed up here. Some of you need to understand who Jesus is and commit to him for the first time in your life. That's some of you. Some of you are here, and you committed to Jesus a long time ago. Grew up in church or had a family member. Somebody shared Jesus with you, and you said, yeah, I'd like some Jesus. That would be great. But you're going back and forth. You're one way with your teammates and your friends, and then you're another way when you're in some environment like this, or church, or FCA, or AIA, and you keep going back and forth and back and forth. And you need to surrender. You need to go all in on one of those two directions, because it's the worst to be in the middle. It's the worst. Go all in the other way, then. And some of you are fully surrendered. You're saying, yes, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to do this the best I know. But your worship is still divided because all of our hearts are still divided because of sin. And so you need to understand, okay, what does it look like when I start to go this way to come back to God? What does it look like when my heart pulls me in this direction to come back to God? What does grace look like? That's staff included because you never arrive. And so we're always constantly trying to figure out what does it look like to go back? What does it look like to go back? God, change my heart so it's not divided. And no matter where you are, we all need to be honest that we have some type of divided worship in our hearts. And we need God's Spirit to change that. We do. So that's the first thing. Problem, divided worship. The second is there's a warning that goes with that. Bless you. There's a warning. Deceptive idols. Deceptive idols, counterfeits don't ultimately deliver what they promise. Here's three things that are true of anyone that substitutes or anything that substitutes for God in your life. A, in your notes there, idols are silent, but they still speak. They're silent, but they still speak. We saw it in the story. Five times they call out to Baal, this rain god, this idol, and no one answers their call for help. Idols exist in our hearts and minds, but really, they can't deliver us what we really need at our soul level. They ultimately can't give us what we long for, but they still speak to us. They're still loud. There's still a desire to go after these things because of sin, because of our hearts that can be dark. And so they still speak to us, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they're silent. B, idols are powerless, but they're still strong. We saw in verse 27 that the prophets have called the Baal to display his power to consume the altar with fire. And Baal doesn't show up. He can't do what the people need. Sports, money, marriage, fame, they can't provide that peace, that security, that fulfillment, that significance that only God can provide. And we see this all the time with athletes. You guys know this athlete? He just won another Super Bowl, Tom Brady. At the time, he had only three Super Bowl rings, and he has this quote as he sits down with somebody at 60 Minutes, he gets interviewed, and they're talking about significance. How do you stay motivated in the midst of, you already won three Super Bowls? And he says this, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think, God, there's got to be more than this. He understands he was chasing something, chasing something. He finally achieved it, and it doesn't give him what he wants. It's a strong pull, but at the end of the day, it's powerless. And then, letter C. Idols are deadly, but they still promise life. Baal is supposed to be the rain god, to provide rain for the crops, to, to, to promise to deliver rain, but he doesn't do it. They're ranting, they're raving, they're yelling, they're cutting themselves. They promise life, but they actually lead to death, our idols do in our life. And your sport will as well. Is it possible for an athlete, a coach, a fan to get so hooked, so addicted to their sport, so caught up in the power of the game that they start doing irrational behavior? Yes, is the answer to that. We see it all the time. 
We've got examples of performance enhancing drugs, a one dimensional life, you're over you're, you're overtraining, you're, you're eating wrong, you have eating disorders, you're cheating in your test just so you can be eligible. There's all these things that lead to destruction so that you can keep doing your sport. You can keep worshiping your idol. Here's how an idol, or sport becomes an idol. Here's an equation for you. It's extreme pressure. It's powerful influence. It's a passion to win at all costs. And it's the intoxicating emotions that sport provides for us. Extreme pressure, powerful influence, a passion to win at all costs, and intoxicating emotions. You've got extreme pressure from family, media, alumni, administration, coaches, fans, maybe your city, maybe your extended family. This is the only way we're going to get out of this situation, and you have to be the one to take us there. Maybe we can't pay for college, and this is the only way that you're going to enable yourself to get an education. There is pressure in that as a teenager. Powerful influence, the desire for popularity, fame, prestige, especially some of you that are in college towns where there's no pro sport and your face is on the billboard. You drive down and you see yourself in lights. Mm -hmm. That's powerful influence. You can walk in to somewhere and you can get things paid for, which is an NCAA violation, <laughs> but you look the other way. I mean, come on, let's be real, let's be honest. That's powerful influence. Passion to win at all costs. Winning is important. You're going to hear this from us continually throughout the week. Winning matters. If you don't care about winning, don't play. Don't compete. Just go recreate. Winning matters, but if it's winning at all costs, that's when it starts to become dangerous. And then intoxicating emotions. Because the thrill of victory is real. And the agony of is real. Those are intoxicating emotions. My wife and I are stepping in, as I mentioned, we have three kids, and my middle son is who's here, he's 14, and so he's going into his freshman year playing basketball um, at our school locally, his local school in Phoenix, and watching Summer League. He's just finishing Summer League, and he had uh, 40 games. It's crazy, Summer League. But these parents and coaches are crazy. They're crazy. Netflix did a special on this a couple years back called Trophy Kids. I want to play you a clip from this and watch how this sport has become an idol because of these elements. Some of you are sitting in that chair and you had a parent like that or a guardian like that. Push you and push you and push you and push you. Maybe some of you are like, yes, I love it. Maybe some of you are like, man, do they even like me? Do they even care about me? If sports is your idol, it's going to bring the worst out of you. Idolatry makes sport look ugly. 
Let's talk about how we can recreate and see what God does in response to that. So we had a problem of divided worship, a warning that idols are deceptive. If you want to continue to go all in and follow those idols, you can do that. But at the end of the day, they're not going to bring you life. Point three, what is our response to this? Our response is a daily surrender. A daily surrender. Believe that God is supreme and worthy of my continual submission. And we see that's what's happening in the text. God is calling the people back to him. To say, you need to surrender everything to me in this moment. Stop following Baal and start following me. What does that look like practically? Point A there in your notes. We need a heart renovation. We need a heart renovation. We need to value what God values. We need to have a new prayer from, it's all about me. It's all about me to it's all about you. A prayer from it's all about me to it's all about you. And that's really hard because everybody in your life is probably telling you it's all about you. Definitely people marketing things are saying it's all about you. Your sport might be saying it's all about you and we need to realize it's not. It's not all about us. It's all about God. And Elijah models this prayer as he focuses on God and others instead of just his own needs. You don't see Elijah talking about himself. You see him talking about God and the needs of the people. Elijah asks God to show his power, turn the hearts of the people away from their idols and back to him. And to turn from our idols, we need this heart renovation from the Lord. Point B there. We need a life expression. A life expression to live out what God values. Our new response in that is to let God rule every thought and action. Let God rule every thought and action. Not just a little piece, but every single thought and action that you have. You would say, I would submit it to God. I would give it to God. And we see it in the story. What happens? God displays his power. The fire comes down and it takes away the water. The people fall down on their face and they worship God. But did, did they let God rule their every thought and action? Maybe in that moment they did. But then they might have gone back and forth and back and forth. And that's what we do. We have these moments saying, God, I'm going to give you everything. And it's a continual training to get shorter and shorter to go, I don't want to bounce back and forth. God, I don't want to bounce back and forth. I want to give you my everything and make a decision for you. So we have the problems divided worship. The warning to us is idols are deceptive. Our response should be this daily moment by moment surrender. And then the fourth thing is the reason we can do that is because we have a revelation. We have a declared Savior. And following Jesus changes everything. Because every other religion, every other idol that you're going to worship, it operates on the same principle. This is the principle of idolatry, and this is every other religion, every other thing. It says this, if you obey, you'll be accepted. If you obey, you'll be accepted. If you do this, 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 and this, it will equal this. If you obey, you will be accepted. The problem is you can never do enough. The equation never ends in religion, in idolatry. You just have to do more, and you have to do more, and you have to do more. And that's what we're seeing with Kobe Bryant. He has to do more. Now he can't play, but he's going to come. He has to do more, 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 more to get accepted. And we see it in the story that people can't dance enough. People can't slash themselves enough, and nothing happens. The equation is if you will obey, then you'll be accepted. But the gospel flips it. The good news of Jesus actually flips it. It's not if you obey, you'll be accepted, but you are accepted, therefore, obey. That's the way the gospel works. And even some of us, we come to Jesus and we think it's still the equation. I have to obey, I have to obey, I have to obey, and then God accepts me kind of, maybe, hopefully. We think Jesus is just for our salvation to get to heaven, and then we have to work, 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 work to get accepted by him. But the gospel says you can never work enough. 
That's what grace is. The gospel is not just for the first time person to put their faith in Jesus to go to heaven. The gospel is for every single one of us. I need the gospel every moment, every day. I need the good news that I am accepted. Then I will obey. Where the false gods will mutilate you, we see it in the story, the false gods will mutilate you. The true God mutilated himself for you. And we see that in Jesus on the cross. That's the, this, this the declared Savior part. And this is what Jesus says in John 14, 6. He says that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. No one has access to the Father except through him. He is the life giver, the soul filler. We go to relationships, sports, money. We try to fill our life with those things, but we can only be really filled with Jesus. Jesus says, I am the yes to all of your idols. No, I am the answer. Jesus is the anti-idol. He is the remedy for idolatry. Once you surrender to him, the possibility exists for him to fill your soul and put sport in its proper place. John 10.10 10 says this, that Jesus said about himself that he came to give us life, complete, abundant life. Not a divided life, not divided worship, but complete, complete, abundant life. The devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy with his idols and with his deception, but Jesus destroys the idols through his death, resurrection, and life. And we have the opportunity to follow him. He can give us the desire to value what God values and to live out what God values. Jesus does the renovation in your heart. It has to be Jesus. You can't renovate your heart. It has to be Jesus doing the renovation. We need to do the surrender. That's our part in it, is to surrender continually. And so the question is, will you let Jesus change you? Will you surrender to him? Because some of you are going back and forth, you're going back and forth, back and forth, and you need to be an adult, and you need to make a decision. Draw a line in the sand. Stop messing around with Jesus and follow God. And I know it's hard. I get it. But you've got to surround yourself with people that love Jesus, and that's what this week is about. Because no decision is a decision. Right? No decision is a decision. So you can't say, well, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I, nobody's ready to follow Jesus. That's not it. You just have to surrender and trust by faith and what he's done on the cross for you. Let's look at this last illustration of the lunch tray. This is what we're after. I know you can't see it there at the bottom, but there's different things, compartmentalized, sport, family, friends, school, but God is the whole tray. He's the whole plate. We're not asking you to change. You had, a, you had God at the bottom, and now he's the biggest part of your tray, but you still have divided stuff. We're saying God is in and through everything. He gets everything in your life, including your sport. And it will change the way you compete. You'll compete free for maybe the first time. It's so refreshing to be able to play that way. And that's what we're after. So you have to ask yourself, which tray are you eating off of? Have you fully surrendered your life to Jesus? That's what audience of one really is about. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks for your goodness that you don't leave us here, but you empower us to understand what it looks like. Thanks for the story of Elijah to trust you, to walk by faith, and that you show up. God, all of our idols that we continue to trust will fail us. Help us surrender daily to you. And we ask that you would change us in that process. Thanks, Jesus. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So flip the page on your notebooks. And this is what's called the live it page. Refs, uh, interns, if you're repping, you can go ahead and go out to the fields. Everybody else, you can stay put. Flip that page in your notebook. And realize, listen, 
this, this part's really important. This is the dot. This is going to be able to connect the dots from where we're going to film to what we're doing to competing. So pay attention to these charts. Pay attention to these limit pages. I want you to take a couple minutes and I want you to look at those lists of when you're competing and you're